Thank you very much, and thank you everyone for having me here to uh, to give a talk about um, my work. Uh, so, as the title goes, uh, the, today's talk is going to be a, a heavily focused on compartmental models of of disease transmission. So, focusing on epidemiology, and while there's many different flavors of compartmental models like Markov chains, uh, difference equations, um, as I uh, was indicated, that things will focus on uh, the use of ordinary differential equations. Um, so to begin with, I'll kind of give a brief little overview of where compartmental models come from. Um, like, why is it that they have the form that they do before getting into some of the applications of compartmental models and how we can use them to inform on uh, disease evolution or um, the analysis of like uh, disease interventions. Um, after I, I get through that kind of application, um, I'll illustrate how uh, if you generalize the traditional concept of a, a like a disease model, that you can obtain new insights that are uh, many thought were impossible from kind of deterministic models, um, as well as more appropriately capture like the, the epidemiology of disease. Uh, and then you know I'll tell off just with that some of the current projects that I, I'm working on. Uh, so to begin with, uh, where do compartmental models come from? Well, uh, if we go back to 1927, uh, there was a seminal paper by Kermack and McKendrick, uh, and they were the real first to put uh, disease modeling, in particular compartmental modeling, on a solid foundation. Um, unfortunately, the papers that they wrote, uh, they're kind of uh, intense to go through, uh, but the basic concept of these models is that they viewed uh, inf new infections occurring at uh, an instant on various discrete intervals. So I have here a nice little picture where it shows that on one week, there's I knew. Um, so essentially, that's just new infections on week zero. Uh, you can proceed to the next week. Uh, you have new infections that occur that week, and so on and so on. And then the other kind of aspect of information is that uh, for these new infections, uh, they all essentially recovered at the same kind of rate. Um, so they had like a survival function that uh, described how, how they would you know, recover from disease. And it was the same survival function that they had, regardless of the time that you were infected or the week and whatnot. Uh, so, so using this information, um, um, they would, could essentially add up all of these kind of components, and they, they would get uh, an estimate of the people that are currently infected. Uh, so this is a nice little summation. Um, and the notion is here is that, well, if we want to translate this to something like differential equations, uh, whereas before this is kind of discrete, well, what do we have to do? Well, we need to let the, the interval width go from weeks to something which is infinitesimally small. And if we do that, we end up at something called an integral equation. Uh, so this integral equation is essentially just the uh, continuous version of a discrete sum. Um, but the notion is, is that this equation here is essentially responsible for all the compartmental models that you see out there. Um, so how do we come across that? Well, we need two kind of basic assumptions to take this complicated integral equation and derive essentially all the differential equations that we see. The first kind of assumption um, is that, that that period that people recover corresponds to an exponential distribution. Uh, so essentially that just means that um, things decay exponentially, uh, that the gamma that you see in the exponential distribution here, oh, let me get my marker going, um, that's essentially the recovery rate that people often see in a lot of compartmental models. And then the other kind of fundamental um, aspect is that uh, we need something called the, the law of mass action. And that relates how new infections occur. Uh, so it implicitly assumes that new infections occur at a rate that is proportional to the number of people that are infected and then the number of people that are susceptible. And there's some minor tweaks on that, like uh, so we have a transmission rate, which is the beta here, and that uh, combines aspects of things like transmission probability and contact rate. And um, I have here the number of infected, the I here divided by N. So that's just a, a clever way of saying it's the fraction of those contacts with infectious people that lead to new infections. Um, so with this kind of setup, um, if you were to plug these into this integral equation, take the derivative and then sub things back in, uh, accounting for the fact that you have to use Leibniz rule for differentiation, you would arrive at your kind of classical ODE compartmental model for describing how infection goes. So essentially, and, and this is the start of where all compartmental models come from. Okay. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, there are many, many, many compartmental models that people have probably encountered if they've taken a, a first 
differential equation course or more. Maybe some people have seen things in calculus or from reading papers or whatnot. Uh, but some of the real classical ones out there um, include things like a susceptible infectious model. Um, so here I've, I've changed things from a capital S to lowercase and capital I to lowercase. So the difference here is that that denotes typically proportions as opposed to the total number of, of people that are infected in a given state. Um, and for a susceptible infectious model, we'd have two differential equations. One describes the rate of change of susceptible people. The other one describes the rate of change of infectious people. And we can represent that schematically uh, with something called the compartmental diagram. So here, the compartmental diagram you see has two little circles. The circle with the S represents essentially the susceptible people and people are, are leaving that susceptible class and at the rate beta times I and the becoming infectious. Uh, we can go one step up from this, and that's a susceptible infectious susceptible model. And the big difference here is that schematically, uh, we've tacked on that recovery rate that's mentioned earlier. And the big difference uh, is that there's in the compartmental diagram is that there's an extra arrow um, where people are now recovering at the rate gamma going back into the susceptible category. And then the last kind of uh, classical compartmental model that I'll just mention here, is something called an IR model. Uh, so this one is uh, less heralded than a lot of the others. This essentially just amounts to exponential growth or decay. And the IR model stands for infectious and removed. And uh, likewise, you could just have a simple rate describing how people go from I to R. And the big motivation of illustrating these three models is that, unfortunately, these are the only three classes of compartmental models that have handy closed form solutions that we can deal with. Everything else requires um, other kind of analysis techniques using numerics or some stability analysis or whatnot to use uh, to uh, gain information in terms of what's happening, uh, which is unfortunate because typically when we're building disease models, we have more than just two states to describe you know, the transmission process of disease. Uh, so now I'd like to get on to um, an actual real life application of compartmental models. Uh, so this one here, is um, focused on some uh, HIV infection. So I, I believe most people have heard of HIV before. Uh, if you're not, then where have you been since 1990s? Uh, but a few people have probably heard of hepatitis G. Um, I say this because hepatitis itself is a very common term or, or whatnot, because most people have heard of hepatitis A, B, and C. Those are essentially very bad uh, diseases where you, if you get them, you can have like liver complications and all kinds of like negative effects or whatnot. Uh, however, most people have never heard of this, this hepatitis G version of things. And I say this because hepatitis G is a really, really interesting virus. Um, in fact, there was this study on hepatitis G um, a while back, so I think back in the early 2000s, that showed that if you happen to be infected with HIV and you were also infected with HI or the hepatitis G, it actually prolonged your life, which is a little ridiculous at first, right? Like, how is it that you're infected with another virus and you've lived longer? Um, so a lot of people, when they first hear this, there's like, it's kind of shocking. But if you look in the history of medicine, uh, viruses have actually been used to treat other viruses in the past. Um, one of the more notable examples is uh, malaria was actually used to treat a syphilis. So I think it was uh, in France in the 1700s. Uh, I'm not 100 percent sure on that date, but a syphilis used to cause a, a really bad, um, you know, it was bad, incurable at that point in time. So what they would do is they would infect people with malaria parasites that they could treat it would cause a really, really bad fever that would ex, uh, actually kill off the, uh, whatever syphilis was, and they would recover. Another probably uh, more close example, at least in recent history, is the vaccine for smallpox. Um, cowpox was actually the, the virus that was used to develop the smallpox vaccine. Uh, and you know, if you want to look even more recently in terms of medicine, any live attenuated vaccine is actually a, a virus that you're infected with, and it give, uh, gives your body the training wheels to essentially fight off similar viruses. So given this idea, um, part of the question is, if we were to use this hepatitis G strain as a, like a vaccine for people that are infected with uh, HIV, um, how beneficial is it? And 
if we were to use it as a biovaccine, could it like mutate into something that might cause disease on the level of like hepatitis C or something like that? Um, so a few more facts about hepatitis G. Um, it's actually a rare uh, virus that is not known to cause any negative effects. In fact, uh, one in six people have been infected with hepatitis G and they don't even know it. Um, the study that uh, was on HIV and hepatitis G co-infection found that on average that uh, people that were infected with hepatitis G lived over two years longer. Um, genetically, um, hepatitis G is actually closely related to hepatitis C. Um, and its transmission routes are similar to a lot of sexually transmitted diseases, um, mainly through like bodily fluids and whatnot. And well, uh, I've been referring to hepatitis G as hepatitis G. Um, it's, it's actually found that it doesn't reproduce or replicate in the liver. So um, it's officially been reclassified or renamed. So it's now officially known as something called the human pegavirus. Um, but I always say hepatitis G because most people have never heard that there's actually other hepatitis strains out there. Okay. So uh, how do we use compartmental models to describe this? Uh, well, the basic idea was to make kind of an elementary model of HIV uh, infection. Uh, so here I have a really kind of simple compartmental model. So each one of these circles essentially is represented by a differential equation. And we have some rates in which, for instance, here, uh, people that are susceptible to HIV would become infected uh, with HIV. And then uh, they might progress to uh, being uh, classified as AIDS, or they could realize that they're HIV infected and progress to HIV with treatments, because if uh, you're treated, it takes much longer to develop AIDS. And then finally, um, people that are treated with HIV or that have HIV and are treated. Uh, eventually, they might have treatment failure and progress to AIDS with treatment. So we take this model, and then we tack on essentially a second kind of uh, direction to account for uh, infection with hepatitis G. Uh, so if you look at the epidemiology of hepatitis G, essentially there's kind of two things that go on. Uh, one, uh, people get infected with hepatitis G, and then they clear infection, so they would go back to the susceptible category. Uh, but then for some unknown reason, there's a certain proportion of a population that has a uh, long-term infection. So they don't clear the virus, but it still doesn't cause any negative uh, effects. So we have this dynamic here of going from susceptible uh, to short-term infection or long-term infection or heading back to the susceptible states. Uh, so given this, we then have to extrapolate this for all categories. So we have this nice handy co-infection model that is describing uh, hepatitis G and HIV co-infection. And the notion is um, by increasing the rate at which people might be infected with hepatitis G, uh, we can evaluate its benefit. So in essence, the big uh, idea here is that if people are infected here um, in these two kinds of categories, it takes them much longer to progress to uh, this, this category of AIDS. So that's the basic idea for uh, this kind of model. But if we wanted to investigate uh, evolutionary aspects, essentially what we need to do is consider a, a mutant strain of hepatitis G. So something that maybe does cause a death or mortality or, or has a negative effects. Uh, so what that means is we'd actually have to duplicate all of the structure that we have here. So in doing this, uh, we end up with a system of 25 uh, differential equations to describe this process of not only a, a HIV and hepatitis G, but also the mutant hepatitis G. And the big question we want to find out is uh, under what conditions um, essentially will this mutant strain die out, or can we prevent it from like overtaking the current strain? Um, so rather than like hit everybody with a wall of equations, uh, it can explain this concept uh, very nice with a, a little diagram here. Uh, so the idea here, um, classically, if we were to have hepatitis G, um, there's going to be some level of a proportion of a population that are, is going to have this disease. And the question that we have is that under what parameter settings, um, if we were to introduce a mutant, uh, like increase the, the prevalence of hepatitis G, if there was mutation, well, um, will things remain the same? So for instance here, if I look at the diagram A here on the left, um, if there's some kind of mutation that occurs, all the arrows are pointing back 
this proportion of infected people here, this little uh, blue circle. So in this case, this is the scenario that we would want. Uh, somehow the, the current strain that is circulating is going to prevent this evolutionary aspect from taking over. So there's no risk of some high mortality causing mutant strain. Whereas uh, the figure on the right, uh, this is the scenario that we want to avoid uh, because if mutation occurs, uh, well, then all of a sudden this uh, death causing strain is going to be circulating freely in the population. So, so that's the basic idea. Um, so we can take our model. Uh, we look up all kinds of data in terms of um, um, the prevalence of hepatitis G, its transmission, likewise for HIV. And then we kind of extrapolated uh, from hepatitis C how bad the mortality might be from, from uh, for a mutant version of the strain. So our mutant version is kind of based on hepatitis C. And we wanted to see, okay, uh, how transmissible or how bad would things have to be, uh, you know, for this health benefit of hepatitis G to be, you know, countered out. Uh, so in looking at this, the first question is, um, first of all, under what conditions could this mutant strain uh, invade a population and persist? So we have uh, an easy way to uh, kind of gauge that, and that is looking at the reproductive numbers of the resident strain and the reproductive numbers of the mutant strain. Uh, so if you're not familiar with the reproductive number, um, essentially the idea is, is that in a completely susceptible population, it's how many uh, people that one person would transmit the disease to. Um, and if the, 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 the non-mutant strain of hepatitis G is essentially bigger than, uh, has a higher reproductive number than the mutant, kind of provides protection from that mutant taking over. So, um, and looking at this for all of the simulations, the basic idea is this, is that um, in order on, on median for the, a mutant strain to invade a population and take over um, with any sort of mortality that is similar to what hepatitis T offers, it would have to be like over, uh, I think, 15 times more transmissible, which is insane. That, that'd be going like from something that is as transmissible as the flu to something that's more transmissible than measles. Uh, so it's an indication that, you know, uh, if hepatitis G were to be used as a vaccine for HIV-infected people, it'd be unlikely um, for some mutant strain to like start circulating the population. Okay. Uh, so the idea here is that um, if, if this ratio is above one, then the mutant can invade. If it's below one, it's unlikely to invade. Okay. Uh, so to kind of summarize things quickly, uh, so if you based on the demographics, the fact is, is that if we were to actually um, uh, scale up the use of, uh, or sorry, a hepatitis G, so that way is I think 12.5 to 25% uh, more prevalent, um, we can actually save a pretty substantial proportion of AIDS incidences, uh, so 6.7 to 31.5 per 1,000 people. And uh, importantly, we can also prevent a similar number of deaths. So essentially, you're giving like two years of life or delaying, uh, you know, for a lot of people. All right. So that is a quick illustration of, of how you can use a co essentially a compartmental model to not only inform on health policy, um, but also on disease evolution uh, without going into too many of the, the walls of equations or whatnot. Up next, um, I'd like to talk about kind of how we can tweak the construction of compartmental models to provide new insights. Uh, so for this one here, I'm going to focus on uh, disease elimination and reemergence uh, in of measles in Iceland. Uh, so part of the reason for this is that Iceland is an island community, so it's kind of off the, the coast of Europe, um, and it as a place that actually has immaculate health records. So they have like biweekly data on a lot of diseases going back to like the 1900s. So it's it's insane that the level of detail that they have. Uh, in fact. Uh, there's this amazing book by Cliff and Haggett that publishes that, this data. And not only that, they often record the sources of outbreak. So if you were to look historically uh, about the measles in Iceland, a lot of the cases of measles started from Danish fishermen that had traveled to Iceland with measles and they re continually reintroduced measles. It would cause a massive outbreak and then it would die out and there would be like no measles for like 10 years. And then Danish fishermen would come back and do the same thing. It, it, so it's a great data set if you're ever interested in it. So the idea here, uh, if you've never heard of measles, it's typically regarded as a childhood disease, um, which means that once you have it, 
you typically can't get it again. Uh, so it, in ideal circumstances, it should be, you know, uh, you should do well to be able to describe it with uh, states of susceptibility, infectiousness, and then removed. Uh, in a nutshell, those are the best states that you could use to describe it. I mean, you can make more elaborate models. But the question is, given our kind of classical formulation of compartmental models, can we inform on um, if the disease will be eliminated, um, when elimination will occur, and when the disease might return? Uh, so, so if we look at, once again, this, this data set, so this is data from Iceland. Uh, there's an outbreak in 19, or just after 1928. It ends right before 1930. And then there's no documented incidences till after like 1936. So can we use a kind of differential equation compartmental model to describe this? Um, so we wanted to inform on will elimination occur? Um, we can use a trick where we take this differential equation, we drop the transmission term. So that's the beta is term. And when we do that, we can actually solve this differential inequality using uh, integrating factors. So this is the same kind of technique that you could learn in um, a first year differential equation class for linear differential equations, but apply to an inequality. And in doing this, uh, we get that the proportion of infected uh, is bounded by an exponential term. Uh, so if it's exponential, uh, the only time it really reaches zero is as t approaches infinity. So what this means is that your kind of classical compartmental model is never going to be able to give you any information on the when of elimination. And that sucks because I, I don't know about you, but I want to know when diseases get eliminated as soon as possible, uh, especially when uh, you have like um, uh, diseases like measles that, you know, afflict children or whatnot. So in part, how can we take this uh, classical model and make a tweak that maybe we could describe such a process? Uh, so one of the ideas um, is to take a, this differential equation term and go back to its kind of roots. So one of the fundamental assumptions of compartmental models is that transmission is based on the law of mass action. However, the true law of mass action includes powers. So, uh, so you, this term here, there, there's an alpha to the, um, on, there's a power to the I. So this is actually more reflective of the, of the classical law of mass action that comes from like uh, describing chemical solutions and whatnot than, than the one that is often used in a lot of disease modeling. So through taking this term and going back to the roots, um, maybe we can actually describe this process. All right. So with this kind of tweak of adding this kind of original law of mass action to compartmental models, can we inform on when elimination will occur? So it turns out, so we've chosen this kind of advanced model with a tweak. Uh, if we take this model and fit it to data, um, we can get some you know, a nice fit here. And if we were to examine the parameters, it turns out just based on the parameters that we can, uh, I can actually inform you that elimination is not a feature of the model. If this, this alpha power is less than one or kappa is greater than alpha, or likewise, if kappa is greater than or equal to one, and that elimination will occur uh, for cases three and four here. So this means that just based on the parameters, you can determine, yes, there will be disease burnout or no, there won't. Uh, so to quickly kind of illustrate uh, how that works, we use the kind of same trick that we did before. Uh, so we have our compartmental model. Um, we can, in this case, bound it by assuming that S is equal to one and make it into a differential inequality use integrating factors to kind of uh, solve it. And we get this bound on the times to elimination. Uh, so I don't know about you, but whenever somebody proposes some magical formula to predict when a disease will burn out, uh, I'm always a little hesitant. So the question is, is this bound any good? Because if it's going to say that uh, measles is going to be eliminated in 30,000 years, well, I mean, we saw from the picture, it was roughly 10 years after the epidemic that um, you know, or sorry, a year after the epidemic that things burnt out. Um, so we take this data, and as I said, we do a simple fit. And based on the data, uh, it uh, illustrates that after 278 days that the disease kind of burnt out in, in, in Iceland. Um, from the simulation base for that compartmental model, uh, things burnt out after 304 days. And if we use this inequality, 
it says 361 days, which is insane in the sense that uh, one, if we wanted to wait for the time series data, we'd actually have to wait for the pen, uh, that, uh, epidemic to end. Two, uh, um, if we wanted to use the simulation data, well, we'd actually have to design a model, calibrate it, and do a whole bunch of uh, hardcore simulations. And to many people that don't have strong math backgrounds, that might be difficult. Uh, but three, this inequality is essentially just using numbers in algebra. So it uh, was a very kind of easy way to come up with a quick kind of estimate as to, okay, how long are we at risk for? Great. So with that in mind, uh, we've been able to, with this tweak, inform on the amount of time it takes for a disease to eliminate, uh, be eliminated. And we can use the same kind of trick to actually inform on when a disease might return. Uh, so that the trick here is uh, essentially to look at something called the effective reproductive number. Uh, so it's the effective reproductive number is similar to the basic reproductive number. Only um, it also accounts for the fact that not everybody in that population is going to be uh, susceptible to the disease. So I have here kind of a quick formulation for this. And the important aspect is, is that um, for disease to spread or to inc infect more and more people, the effective reproductive number has to be greater than one. Uh, if it's less than one, uh, then that means the disease is dying out. So given this kind of uh, equation, um, if we use this effective reproductive number and find out when it surpasses one, that will give us insight as to when the disease could potentially return. Great. So once again, we use the same kind of uh, trick where we can simplify this model. So here we have the differential equation for DSDT, but we know that disease has been uh, eliminated. It's burnt out. So that means I is zero. Uh, so if that's the case, this DSDT boils down to a linear differential equation, which we can solve. And then we can use that in our effective uh, to come up with kind of a close form for that. And then all we want to do is find out, hey, when does this cross the threshold of one? Um, so in doing this, I have a, a little plot here of our effective along with the critical value of one. So we can see here, um, it surpasses the critical threshold of one just before 1928. Uh, so if we go back to our model fit, um, and look at things, well, you know, it's not predicting exactly when the next epidemic occurs, but it's giving us a warning in terms of, hey, uh, in 1928, Iceland should have been, uh, you know, sounding alarms or preparing for the fact that, that there's likely going to be another uh, measles outbreak. Okay. All right. Uh, so with that, uh, that's the quick deal in terms of uh, how you can modify um, compartmental models with a little power and inform on things like disease burnout and reemergence. So now for the last little bit, um, I wanna talk about uh, generalized ODE compartmental models. So I have a little bit of time here. Uh, so the idea here uh, of these models is that um, if we look at a lot of diseases, so here I have gonorrhea as the example, um, we should be able to describe them pretty well using basic compartmental models. Uh, so gonorrhea is the choice here because the fact that uh, there's evidence that suggests that there's little to no immunity developed from infection, which means that once you get gonorrhea and are cured, you're immediately susceptible again. So under that dynamic, an SI model should do a pretty good job of describing the trajectory of gonorrhea. So we take this and we actually fit it to uh, recent data on gonorrhea in the United States. We have this little trend here, that's the data. And an SIS model uh, through a, which is a simple least squares fit, gives us this nice kind of straight line. And I don't know about you, but I am uh, not inspired by the quality of this, this prediction. However, the fact is, is that this model should do really, really well for projecting it because, you know, uh, it, it perfectly describes the fact that you're either susceptible or infected and there's nowhere in between. So how can we do better? Um, so we can develop a new type of compartmental model. All right, uh, so to kind of motivate this new kind of compartmental model, um, I have some information I need to uh, lay on everyone. And that is uh, to first of all, consider the duration of infection. Uh, so before I had this as a survival function, but the idea is, is if we consider disease that uh, you can be infected in between zero and 14 days, and there's some kind of distribution where, you know, maybe you'll be infected for seven days, maybe it'll be 10.5 or so on, uh, but everybody essentially follows this kind of distribution. The other thing to take, uh, take in mind is that kind of like the initial setup of uh, incidence data is reported weekly. 
Um, so if that's the case, essentially things break down into people that are infected for just one week or under one week or for two weeks. Uh, so we'd have here also a conditional distribution. So, so essentially the, the bottom distribution here is describes the people that are infected for over seven days uh, after seven days have passed. And that the top one is essentially all new people are distributed like this. Um, so with that in mind, we can quickly describe here um, how uh, an outbreak might look. So if we have a plot here of instance data, um, the incidence data, every little gray curve, the height corresponds to the number of people have infected. And it curves it decays just like that, that survival function. And there's two kinds of components. So if, if we go from like a week three to week four, um, those are all the people that recovered in the first seven days. And the little dark regions here, uh, the dark gray regions, those are corresponds to the people that are infected for, uh, you know, seven to 14 days. Uh, so importantly here, if we look at these kind of curves, uh, we have two pieces of information. One is that the red curve is the average duration of infection, and the blue curve is the average infectious period. So these things are often taken to be the same, but they're actually different. Uh, the average infectious period does not change throughout the course of an epidemic, whereas the average duration of infection does. My quick case in point for that is that um, consider the average duration of smallpox in the world. Well, nobody's infected with smallpox, so it doesn't have an average duration of infection, or it, it still has an average infectious period. Uh, so the premise here is um, the generalized compartmental models will actually account for the fact that there's this change by accounting for the average um, infection or duration of infection rather than the average infectious period. So your traditional compartmental models they have the average infectious period. And this generalization um, will essentially represent things by um, a rectangle that has a, a change in width corresponding to the, the, the change in terms of the average duration and a change in height, which corresponds to the change in the average number of infections. Um, so this, in other words, the gray area here by this, this curve on the left will match up exactly with the area of this pink rectangle whereas the blue rectangle will not match. Okay, yeah. Um, and if you're getting into statistics, this, this kind of time varying average duration of infection is referred to as a mean residual waiting time. Okay. Uh, so if we quickly uh, chain, uh, uh, derive this model, we can end up with a very similar version of an SIS compartmental model. Um, so this, there's some slight differences here uh, as there's some derivatives of the mean residual waiting time. Uh, but the big notion here is that its structure is very, very similar to your classical SIS model. In fact, if the mean residual waiting time uh, corresponded to an exponential distribution, um, it would be exactly um, your SIS compartmental model. Okay. Um, so importantly, we can use some trickery to simplify the system. Um, so I can use the conservation law or a total population to re re reduce this from a system of two equations to one. And then it is possible to outright solve this differential equation. Uh, so in fact is, um, you can use a, a, a trick for a Bernoulli differential equation to solve it. And since I, I'm running out of time, I, I don't really need to uh, go over a lot of the derivation of this sort of stuff. Um, but what I really wanna mention here um, is that you can choose different mean residual waiting times. So one that we've tried out here is uh, to add a simple cosine term into this distribution. And when we do that, it leads to a, a mean residual waiting time that is periodic. And uh, you know, we can do all kinds of fun stability analysis of this um, to, to show cool solution properties. Um, but as I said, as I'm running out of time here, so I'm just gonna quickly show the table. The big idea here is that we can actually show that periodic solutions are uh, stable and attracting for this new system of differential equations. Um, and I don't want to sketch the proof because I think I'm running out of time, but the idea here is that, um, so I can skip all this here. Uh, if we go back to our kind of classical model of the SIS to the data, it doesn't do a great job, but with this new kind of generalized version of things, look how well this, this curve fits the data. Uh, I mean, at least I think it does a pretty great job. 
Um, so importantly here for this distribution, we can also look at what the mean residual waiting time looks like and how it changes. Uh, so importantly, this, this new version of things, it has a period of around 40 weeks. Um, so why is this important? Uh, well, it's important because if we look at gonorrhea, who are the people uh, that are mostly infected with gonorrhea? Well, it's uh, essentially um, people that are, I believe, 14 to 25, so school-age uh, kids. And then the question is, well, what does 40 weeks have to do with school-age kids? Uh, well, the trick is here that school-age kids, how, how long does school last for? Typically around 40 weeks, at least in North America. Okay, uh, so the notion here is that uh, you can make tweaks of compartmental models and gain new information in terms of the things that might drive diseases um, and all that fun stuff. So because I think I'm running a bit over, um, I can quickly illustrate that my current and future work is extending this idea of a generalized compartmental models. Uh, so I'm working on a version of things for uh, chlamydia incidents. Uh, so here I have an illustration of just that compartmental model where things are a little bit more complex because we have even more kind of time varying durations of infection. Um, however, we can get really good fits to the data using this kind of version of things, and we can learn new insights with this new types of model. Uh, so to kind of conclude, there's all kinds of things that you can apply compartmental models to inform on uh, from a disease perspective. Um, it includes health interventions, uh, theoretical interventions. Heck, you can use compartmental models to illustrate that zombies can't rise from the dead, um, apply to vector-borne diseases and all that sort of stuff and that there's still new insights that are being developed from compartmental models. So with that, I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Thanks, Scott. Um, are there any questions? Um, I'll ask. Uh, thanks a lot. It was a beautiful presentation. Uh, great overview of Mark Manuals and then the new work um, as well. I'm, I'm, I have this general question, um, kind of uh, a perspective one. So there was the uh, Spanish influenza uh, 100 years ago, and then the first compartmental models came about in the, I think, early 20s, um, at late 20s, maybe. And now we had our big pandemic uh, that we're recovering from. How, how, what role did compartmental models play in this uh, pandemic? Um, were they really influential in the end or not? Uh, and mathematicians turned to them quickly, right? But but well, how, what what how, what's your perspective on that? Uh, so my perspective is, is that compartmental models made so much things worse uh, for the current pandemic. Um, so the fact is, is that uh, you can evaluate the quality of projections by a lot of models. And there has been a ton of compartmental models on, on COVID. And from a, um, an accuracy and forecasting perspective, things have done worse than, uh, than just a constant solution in the vast majority of cases, which is horrendous from a field perspective. Um, but the notion is, is that um, a lot of people were jumping on, on board of doing compartmental model, uh, modeling that maybe didn't have a lot of background in terms of developing and parameterizing things. So, uh, But in general, compartmental models did not do very well uh, for advice in the, the pandemic, unfortunately. I mean, I wish that I had a, a different story on that, but, but they didn't do well whatsoever. Okay, no, thanks. I mean, that's, that's important to, to hear. But uh, yeah, Sorry, of course. I mean, if you're powerful. There, there's some uh, uh, beautiful work by uh, Chris Murray from the Health Metrics Institute that uh, has illustrated the fact that the quality of a lot of the, the models, he did a huge overview of like, I think a, a thousand models or something ridiculous like that and, and illustrated that they didn't do well for rejection of COVID-19. Thanks. Any other questions? Hey. Um, I got a question. Um, so when you had the hepatitis G model, um, you had a, a figure there where you had the, like the median, I can't remember. Um, the median of the reproductive number? Yeah. So yeah. so what was the um, distribution behind that? So like, uh, these so are all deterministic models, so... Yeah, so what we uh, we had distributions of the parameters. Um, uh, so essentially what we did is we randomly sampled the parameter distributions, ran the model, and then kept track of the, uh, the projections in terms of like uh, 
the, the output and whatnot. And then we just essentially used um, a non uh, that that's why we used median. So we had all this huge list of what the simulations results were and we chopped it off. Okay. Uh, in your um, measles uh, model, mm -hmm. um, so you've got the measles dying out and then you're looking at when will reemerge. But how does measles reemerge without some external source, like if it dies out? Yeah, so um, um, results that I didn't show, that actually I think I, I, I have slides that I hid, is that uh, the reemergence came from Denmark. Um, so it's really possible to build up like, um, like a, a control system or uh, like an input output system that links Iceland to uh, Denmark. And the fact is, is that if, um, if you have uh, a, the R effective number that is negative, even though there might be like a, some positive inflow from, uh, from Denmark, it's still going to prevent the infection from catching. It will just die out immediately. Um, in fact, if you give me a second here, I might be able to uh, scroll up to that, that picture. Maybe. Maybe not. It's possible I, I deleted it because I didn't think I was going to have time. Yeah, so this one here um, illustrates that um, I, I attached, essentially, I, I made a model that also described the outbreak in Denmark, and it was linked to the, the one in, in Iceland. Uh, so depending on how sensitive it is, you have small outbreaks that may have occurred and were undocumented in the, the middle of the 1930s. But uh, the evidence against that is that uh, there was such a large outbreak in 1936 that those cases would have depleted the amount of susceptible population for that to occur. So, But you're right, there is a link between things in order for uh, a migration event to occur. Okay, thanks. Um, yes, any further questions? Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't have a question specifically to Scott, other than to say thanks very much for um, a great finale to this series. And I don't know if Scott's attended any of the earlier ones, but I've been at quite a few. And I just wanted to thank MNF and uh, Roxanne uh, for putting the whole thing together. So I feel like it's the end of an era. It's another way of, of saying goodbye to the COVID, to the COVID years. Um, it's sort of been nice to have this discussion of mathematical um, analysis when, when that event was occurring. So thanks very much, guys. So I, I've really enjoyed it. And thanks, Scott, for finishing it off so well. And no problem. Yes, thanks, everyone. Um, I guess if no more questions, this is the end of our series. And I'd really like to thank Scott for um, his last uh, the fight joining us in the final session. And thanks everyone for attending. Thank Bye. you again for having me. Thanks, Amina, Roxanne, everybody. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. See you.